Okay, welcome. Thanks everybody for coming today. Um, this morning at the keynote, we introduced Google Storage for Developers, and today we'd like to tell you a little bit more about it. Hi, my name is Mike Schwartz. I'm an engineer working on the Google Storage project, and my colleague is David Erb. He's the engineering lead for the project, and together we're going to talk to you about Google Storage. And if anybody has questions or you want to see notes about things as we're presenting, please copy down this link and uh, visit us on Wave. I'll just wait a couple more seconds to let people have a chance to copy that down. Okay. So Google Storage is a cloud-based binary object store, and by that we mean that things are structured as buckets and objects. So a bucket is basically just a flat namespace. You can get a bunch of buckets, and you can put objects in the, in the buckets. And for those of you who are familiar with other cloud storage providers, this is a pretty common paradigm. It's, you see it in uh, Microsoft Azure and Amazon S3. Um, and the key thing to think, take away from this is you can have many, many buckets. Buckets can have many, many objects, and objects can be really big. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those sizes later. Another aspect of Google Storage is that you control your data. And this means a couple things. First of all, you can make data private. It's only visible to you. You can make it shared. And you can, we'll talk more about the sharing model. It's a pretty flexible sharing model that we'll be introducing. Um, you can share it with individuals, and we'll talk more about groups, too. Uh, and you can also make it public so the entire world can see your objects. You have a choice over that. And the other aspect about you controlling your data is that you can get your data out at any time. And we believe this is important. Um, across Google, we believe it's important. It's your data. You should be able to get it all out completely anytime you want to. Finally, what does for developers mean? The product's called Google Storage for Developers. Well, anybody will, will be able to uh, sign up for the service. We're introducing it uh, as a trial, as a, a preliminary version for now, and we're going to give you guys a chance to get invites uh, for this initial period a little later in the talk. But eventually, everybody will be able to sign up. But the product's really aimed at developers. So this means a few things. First of all, it uses a RESTful API. And for people who haven't heard the term, REST stands for representational state transfer. It's essentially the model that HTTP is based on. You have a limited set of verbs, like put and get. And then you have URIs for naming everything in the system. And so all the operations are modeled as simple verbs with URIs. And David will talk more about that later, too. Also, there's many different um, software development kits and tools, lots of open source tools and software development kits, many that pre-exist the project, and also some ones that we're introducing. We'll talk about those. And also, there's good integration with Google services. So what are some of the benefits? Well, first of all, it's built on Google's high performance and scalable infrastructure. So, We'll talk more about replication and, and how um, we get good performance and availability out of the system later. Also, very flexible authentication and sharing models, which again, we'll talk about later. And it's easy to get started quickly with um, third-party tools and utilities, some that we provide, some, like I said before, that are available uh, in the open source world. So the first thing I'd like to show you is a quick demo. It's very easy to get started using. Uh, Google Storage, and like I said, at the end of the talk, we're going to give you a link where you can ask to be, to be given an invite. Um, you'll click that invite, and you very quickly can get into using Google Storage, and I'll show you what that looks like right now. So you'll get an email in your box after you fill out this brief form to ask for an invitation, and when you click on the email, it says thank you, and here's your invite. If you click on that, here's the invite. And as you'll notice, I'm actually using a little temporary account here. For the rest of the demos we do, I'm not going to use this account. I'm using this temporary account so that it's actually a brand new invite. This account's never used Google Storage before. And when I log in, what you see is some terms of service, a little welcome page, some terms of service that you should read. And you click, click upset, accept. And the first thing you're taken to is some documentation, and you're welcome to peruse the documentation. There's lots of information available here. However, it's pretty easy to get started, and if you want, you don't even need to go to the documentation. I'm just going to go right over this link, Google Storage Manager, and show you this. So the Google Storage Manager is a web-based user interface uh, that we're providing as part of this release. It has a simple Explorer-like 
model that, you, that you're familiar with from lots of different Explorer services. And as you can see right now, I just have kind of an empty account, no buckets. So the first thing I need, I'm gonna do is create myself a bucket. And I give it the imaginative name, my new bucket. Creates the bucket, and you can click down into there. There's nothing in there right now. It says the things are empty. And you can drag objects in there. So for example, I'm gonna drag this image that I have on my desktop. It's uploading this. And this is, and then what I can do, you can see over here there's a checkbox that's grayed out right now. And that means that the object's currently private. So the default, if you don't specify anything else, or when you first upload the object, is it's private. And you can later change the apples. If I click on this checkbox, I've now just made it publicly readable. And there's more flexibility than that. It's not really exposed right here. We'll talk more about ACLs later. But you could, at this point, if you wanted, go copy this link and email it to your friend or post it in a blog or however you want to expose the thing. What I'm going to do instead, I'm just going to click on it, download it again. And here's this object that I just loaded. This is actually a picture of some of the folks who worked on the project up in the Seattle office. OK, so it's as easy as that. You get an email, you click on it, you read some terms of service, and immediately you can start using Google Storage. And just then when I did that, you know, data was copied onto all of our servers and replicated, how, how David's going to talk later more. It's quite easy to use. OK, so let me talk briefly now about some of the services inside of Google that use Google Storage. There's a number of ones up here. And if you look at them, the way I'd like to break it down is the first two, Panoramio and Picnic. These are services that are a lot like some services that you as a developer might build. And by that, I mean basically lets your users upload data and share it with other users who, can, who then can come in and get to the data. So it's a pretty common usage um, pattern. The ones over here on the right side, uh, DoubleClick and YouTube, these are modeling, uh, if you will, services that are a different kind of service that you might build, which is services that generate data, and then other services consume that data. In this case, I'm talking about reporting data. And that is all done through Big Store, I mean through um, Google Storage. The, the next one, the data liberation, it basically uses Google Storage as a platform for letting users get all of their data out of um, various use Google services. And Google.org, so a few months back when the earthquake hit Haiti, there was a need for the people who were delivering relief to get access to multiple terabytes of satellite imagery. And so we used Google Storage to give them a way to get at that data. And then on the bottom here, Google BigQuery and the Prediction API. These are a couple of um, great new services, uh, APIs that we just announced at the, at the conference this morning. These are analytic frameworks that let you work with really large data sets. And I encourage you to go to tomorrow's 10.15 AM talk to find out more. But let me just give you kind of the brief, briefest you know, one-liner for them. Basically, Google BigQuery lets you analyze what happened in the past, so understand the past. And Google's prediction API helps you to predict the future based on enormous data sets. We also have a number of current users that are partners who helped us you know, test out and give us feedback and work with us as we were bringing the product to market. You can see a number of their logos here. And we're going to actually show you a couple of uh, demos today. We're going to show you Simplicity and the US Navy uh, uh, today right in this talk. So at this point, I'd like to um, turn things over to Damon Moritz, who's with the US Navy Office of Information, to give a demo. Hello. Uh, I'm the video manager for the U.S. Navy Office of Information in Washington, D.C., and our office mission is to collect and disseminate still photos and video that come to us from, out the, from throughout the fleet. And we hand those videos off to the media, documentary producers, we upload to YouTube, places like that, to help tell the Navy's story. Now, when I started this job seven years ago, it was kind of difficult. We would receive a file, we'd get it FTP'd to us, whatever. Uh, a good example is the tsunami. So the files would come in. We would ingest that file, burn it out the tape, run the tapes down to the media, come back upstairs, delete the media because there's a new file. It didn't work. So we went looking for a good solution to allow us to do one good piece of work and then profit from that work forever. In fact, we're still profiting from a lot of the work that we did early on. 
And in doing that, we found Media Beacon. So Media Beacon got us going, and we were doing pretty well. We have a single Ethernet line that fed it on a 100 meg pipe coming into the Pentagon. Things were good. Things were real good. We did Haiti. We, or, or I'm sorry, we did uh, Katrina. We did any piracy operations, but then came Haiti. One of the biggest events that we've ever dealt with. And we went from doing a peak of about 20 terabytes of data burst to 85 terabytes in the span of a month. And everybody kind of panicked. Our customers were calling say, it's not fast enough. It's, it's not giving us what we expect. So we said, well, we have the truck. We know how to, to package it up and get it in our truck. Now we need the highway. We need to get it out and get it out faster. So we started looking around. And what we came across, luckily, was Google Storage. And Google Storage has done some pretty neat things for us. And uh, I actually forgot to start this. This is going to be an example of what Media Beacon looks like. It should play. Anyway. Um, so what Media Beacon with Google Web Toolkit and HTML5 did for us in the, uh, yeah, turn on this. With Google Storage is it's given us a way not only to deliver to our customers, and they don't notice any difference, except that they get better bandwidth. For us, it's a huge deal. It's a massive deal. We don't have any complaints at all. Um, there we go. What it's done beyond that is it's given us a much better way to receive files. So the, the 286 ships that the Navy has at sea, actually half of them are at sea today. Um, some of them are trying to send us files. And we have shore stations all around the world that are trying to send us files. And that has, it has and will greatly improve our ability to receive files so that we can be much, much faster in receiving and delivering our content to the media. So again, for us, it's a huge deal. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, so as Mike said at the beginning, I'm David Erb. I'm the uh, engineering lead for the Google Storage Project up in Seattle. And I'm really excited, finally, to be able to talk about it and to tell you what we've been up to. Uh, Google Storage was uh, conceived as a platform for highly available, highly secure, high performance data storage and transfer. When we set about trying to design the system, one of the first things we did was to try to think about, well, you know, what should this API look like? What should the, what should the paradigm be for our storage? And uh, we, we uh, adopted the philosophy that said, we want to work with what customers are finding uh, successful today. So we designed Google Storage to work well with a lot of existing tools and libraries. One of the paradigms we picked up, as Mike mentioned, is this idea of buckets and objects. So what are buckets? Buckets are flat containers. They don't contain other buckets. They form a global namespace. So if you have a bucket of a given name, nobody else in the world can have a bucket of the same name. Uh, that can lead to some confusion, of course. So one of the things that we introduced is the idea that if you control a DNS name, you can use that as the basis for a namespace of your own. You have to verify that you control the namespace, but you can then, if you're foo.com, you can then have buckets that are called things like images.foo.com and text.foo.com and whatever, and just keep creating them to your heart's content. Another thing that we heard from customers was that it's very important, of course, not to lose their data and to make it available all the time. So one of the things that we do uh, in Google Storage is on every write, we replicate the data to multiple locations, multiple geographic locations, currently only in the US. And despite the fact that we're doing that, we provide a strong consistency model. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Another thing that we thought was really important was to make it simple to authenticate requests, to prove that the requester is who they, they are. And we have a couple ways of doing that that I'll talk about in a minute. We also thought it was important to have flexible ways to share content, to say uh, securely, I, I want so-and-so to be able to read this, but not the rest of the world. Uh, 
And then uh, finally, uh, in addition to all the, the uh, tools and libraries that are already out there that we thought it was important to work with, we thought it was important to provide some tools that help you get started quickly. Mike already showed you the storage manager, and he'll be showing you a command line tool a little bit later. So Mike already mentioned the RESTful API. Here are all the verbs in the API. You can use the get verb to uh, list the contents of uh, a bucket or to retrieve an actual object, the put verb to create a bucket or to create a new object. You can use uh, post to build forms that your users can use to securely upload uh, content to your Google storage uh, bucket. Uh, head, delete, pretty obvious. Um, when you upload an object, you can specify the object type, the content type, and we'll just serve it as that type when it's served up. And objects can be practically any size, hundreds of gigabytes. Um, as I'll mention in a minute, there is, during this preview period that we're beginning today, there is a 100 gigabyte per account limit. So uh, that, that is uh, effectively a limit on object size for the time being. And another thing that we did as far as uh, the uh, sharing model was we wanted to make it possible for you to share securely, but in a simple way. So we took advantage of Google accounts. Um, many of your users have or can easily sign up for a Google account associated with their email address, and you can share content to a specific email account. And in the very near future, we'll add support for sharing to groups. And that's important because suppose that you have an object or a collection of objects, let's say a large collection of objects, maybe a billion objects, that you've shared with some long list of people. Well, that list might change as people come into your company and, or leave or uh, you know, whatever your business needs are, uh, that group might change. You don't want to have to go update a billion objects. Instead, you can just go to groups.google.com and manage the membership of your group to manage access to your objects. I also mentioned that uh, there, we wanted to support flexible ways to authenticate requests. And so, uh, when you share something to someone with a Google account, they can access that content just via a normal web browser as long as they're logged into their Google account. We also support signing requests. When you sign up, you get a, a key pair. You get a public key and a secret key. In this request, you can see a few of the common elements. So put the verb, then the, uh, the name after put specifies a bucket. I creatively named it my bucket. And then the rest of that is the object name. The slashes don't matter. It doesn't matter what characters you put in the object name. So my slash long slash object slash name is all one object name. And then the host, our, our URL, commondatastorage.googleapis.com, a bunch of other more or less self-explanatory fields. And then the authorization header. Goog1 identifies this as a request that uses the syntax native to our service. Because we want to work well with other tools and libraries that already exist, that might also say, for example, AWS, in which case we would interpret it not as Amazon credentials, but as a, a, a request formatted in the Amazon Web Service format. That's followed by a public key that begins with Goog and a bunch of numbers, and then a signature that you compute using a secure hash over the contents of the header. When you create an object, I didn't specify any access control in that previous request, and so by default, it was private. I can read it, nobody else can. I could have specified that it was public, or I could have specified a, a few different uh, simple things that you can just specify in a header, or I could upload an access control list later and determine who has what access to the object. The access control model is pretty simple. Uh, access control lists apply to buckets and to objects. In the context of a bucket, an access control list determines who can list the contents of the bucket, read permission, determines who can create new objects in the bucket, write permission, and then full control means people can interact with the bucket ACL as well. The object ACL model is even simpler. You can either uh, read the object or you can have full control over its uh, ACL. You'll notice there's no write ACL on an object, and that's because the 
write permissions are associated with the bucket. And that does mean that if you have write access to a bucket, you can overwrite or delete objects that are in that bucket. So I'd like to show you uh, a, a quick demonstration of um, what one of our partners did uh, around our sharing model. Hi, I'm Leonard Chung, CEO of Simplicity. Simplicity is a file management solution that lets you easily sync, share, access, and back up all of your files across all of your computers and Google Docs. We also provide a way for IT to centrally control and protect files across the company through policies and reporting. We already provide first-class synchronization of any file with Google Apps and Google Docs, with nearly 12,000 customers. We think this market is going to find Google Storage to be a compelling solution. Let me show you Simplicity integrated with Google Storage. I'm going to modify a document on my desktop as I normally would within my My Documents folder. I double-click on the file, and it opens right up in Word. I'll make a few changes to the document, and I'll go ahead and hit Save, just as I normally would. As I hit Save, in the background, Simplicity has automatically backed up, versioned, synced, and if I so desired, shared this file in real time. If I'm part of a company, it automatically also complies with my corporate information policies, including retention and sharing as set by my company administrator, and can be set to be pushed to existing infrastructure like file servers. If I switch over to my laptop, you'll be able to see that the file has automatically been changed and synchronized down to this computer. If I'm on my mobile phone or on any computer, I can access the new version immediately through either a rich client or an optimized website. And if I refresh the document listing in my Google Docs account, I'll be able to see it here as well. If the change was accidental, I could restore the original file myself through the Simplicity website instead of calling IT. But I can also call my IT administrator to do the restore remotely. I'm not going to touch on the full administrative capabilities of Simplicity, but to demonstrate, I'll switch over to my web browser where I'm logged in as an administrator and do a remote restore of the previous version. All of this is possible in real time because of the robust and performant consistency model in Google Storage. We're excited that Google is innovating at their storage layer with tie-ins to Google Apps and other Google infrastructure. We can leverage this rich functionality to deliver more capabilities and a terrific user experience to our customers. As you can see, the previous version has immediately flowed back down to my desktop. We manage over 250 million customer files today, spanning hundreds of terabytes. Our mutual customers have been asking us for a Simplicity solution that included Google Storage, so we're pleased to be here today. One of the things you might have uh, noted uh, in that uh, brief video was a mention of uh, how some things are possible due to the strong consistency model. Let me talk a little bit more about what that model is and what it might mean to you. Uh, when you write an object to a cloud storage system, you want, to, uh, you want to make sure that you'll be able to read it after you've written it. Kind of obvious, goes without saying. But um, one thing in our experience at Google that uh, has really been driven home to me is that you have to be prepared for things to fail. Disks fail, computers fail, racks of machines fail, data centers fail, networks fail, whole regions can be out of commission, and you have to keep things working in the face of all these kinds of failures. So in particular, when you write something, you may, the, the write may work and everything might might go very well and the system that you write to might generate a success response and that response might never get to you. You might have gone offline, uh, the network may go down, anything could happen. So you need to understand the behavior of the system in the presence of that, uh, that kind of behavior. So our model is very simple. If you do a write and you see it succeed, all subsequent reads are gonna see the results of that write. If you do a write and you can't tell what happened, if you do a read and you see the results of that write, all subsequent reads will see the results of that write. So what does this mean to you when you're building your applications? Well, I've built this very sophisticated web form here. 
uh, in my application. And uh, I'm using it to uh, serve this form to a customer so they can upload a photo to my service. So the user clicks Submit and does an HTTP post to Google Storage or whatever cloud storage provider. Um, in that uh, form post, there's a redirect that tells the browser where it should go after, doing the, after getting a, a success on the post. And the, uh, so the, the redirect sends the browser back to your web service, to my web service, we'll say, my server that, that's running the, the photo app. And that's how I know, uh, that's how my server knows, my app knows, that the user has submitted some new content. So what am I gonna do? Of course, I'm gonna go immediately read the content. I'm going to index it, or I'm going to thumbnail it, or I'm gonna do something else with it. But I might hit a totally different region. I might hit a server on the other side of the country. With a weak consistency model, or an eventual consistency model, that might not work you might get a 404 back. But with the Google storage consistency model, uh, you, you know that uh, the, the success of the previous write means that you will be able to read the content. In this case, a delightful family photograph I took uh, on a hike near Seattle. So let me talk a little bit also about um, interoperability. It's, our strong belief at Google that it's important for you to be able to have choice, for you to be able to choose the cloud provider that you want to work with, and for you to be able to choose the tools that you want to work with. So this drove a lot of our decisions about how to build Google Storage. You should be able to move your data to, to, to choose a cloud provider, or even multiple providers, if that makes sense for you. And you should be able to use a consistent uh, tool set with those providers. So with that, I'm gonna turn things back over to my colleague Mike, who will uh, show you some examples of uh, how interoperability works. Okay, so what you see here is a diagram of some of the tools I wanna talk about here. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's quite a few tools, open source tools and libraries available. I'm talking about just a, a few of them here today. Earlier I gave a demonstration using GS Manager, a web-based uh, tool for interacting with Google Storage. Uh, today, I'm gonna, right now, I'm gonna show you uh, an example of using a command line tool that we're open sourcing and releasing with the product today called GSUtil. And GSUtil is implemented on top of uh, the popular Bodo open source library, which is a Python library built for interacting with cloud storage services that was implemented by Mitch Garnett. And I'm also gonna talk about the App Engine SDK and show you how easy it is to build an application that uses App Engine to talk to, to Google Storage and serve it off of the Google App Engine infrastructure. So here I've got a simple uh, shell command line prompt. And GSUtil was fashioned after um, simple Unix commands for listing and copying data around. And so for example, if you just say GSUtil ls, this shows you all of the buckets that I, this logged in user has. Uh, logged in, I should say, this user whose credentials are known by the GSUtil um, tool. Uh, so in this case, I just have the one bucket. Um, and you'll see that the, the, the command line tool produces listings with a URI-like syntax. And so here it's saying there's this GS provider with a bucket GS2010. And you actually can um, name providers, buckets, and objects this way. So for example, I could, I could use the same command, and I could list this, this command, gsutil ls, gs colon slash slash, is equivalent to the little shorthand I just did. I could also use it to list, uh, this, this user happens to have buckets at Amazon's S3 service. And I can even do it, I can even list both. Oops. So in a single line, I can list all the buckets that I have in both of these services. Next thing I want to show you is how to put your, upload your data to the cloud using this command line tool. So I'm going to just use a local Unix ls minus l command. You can see I have in this directory um, a couple of files and a directory. And so I want to upload all this data to, to the cloud. 
And I can do that simply by saying JSUtil copy star, and I'm going to copy it up to this bucket that I already show you I have. And that's, it's as easy as that. It's going to copy all the files and all the files within all the bucket and all the, the, the directories up to the cloud. And I can see that the files have been copied there now by doing an ls on the bucket. OK, so those are the files. I can also use an ls minus l command. In this case, it's going to show me some information about the bucket. Uh, it's a, what it is is a listing of the ACL on the bucket. And this long string is a canonical ID that's for this user's saying that this is the, user, the, the one user. So this is a private bucket that, it, that one user has full control. No one else has read access besides that user. And if I, say, if I want to see everything that's in the bucket itself, I can use a wildcard. So here, this is going to give me information about all the different objects in the bucket, the things I just uploaded. And you can see the upload times, and you can see the MIME types, and, and also the ACLs. And again, the ACLs show that all of the objects I uploaded are initially private, full control just to me, the user that has this here. So, and one other thing that's kind of handy to do, either if you're interested in knowing more to see the, the underlying HTTP protocol that's being used, the RESTful protocol, or sometimes for debugging purposes, if you want to see what's going on, if you add the minus D option, and I'm just going to look at a um, uh, short thing because it's going to generate a lot of output. I'm going to use GSUtil minus D LS on the bucket. And that actually will show you the, H the HTTP headers, the, the request. There's the get request and the headers that are being sent, including the authentication header. And there's the response. So that's kind of handy to do. So one other thing I want to point out is this URI syntax with the combination of the URI syntax and wildcarding is actually not just convenient, it also was a very pra practical, in a very practical sense, represents the comment we've been making several times now, both David and I have made, about um, giving users the control to get their data out at any time. So in particular, say I have a bunch of files and up inside a bucket and I want to get the data out for whatever reason, it's as easy as saying gsutil copy to the local directory. And there I've done it. I've just copied all my data back out of the cloud. And if I want, I could even copy it all over to another provider. So it's as easy as that. Thank you. OK, so now I've talked to you about the command line tool. Um, and that tool is useful for, if, if you're someone like me, I actually like using command line tools better than GUIs, but it's you know, a matter of personal preference. It also can be useful for scripting. So for example, if you had a big site and you wanted to, had a, had a production site and you had a bunch of content you wanted to make live, you could write a script that would run GSUtil and copy it into a production bucket and set a make, make live bit, however that works in your application. Next thing I want to show you is about the library one level down from there. If you remember, it's this extended version of Bodo. Um, and what we did was we extended it with a, uh, a new class hierarchy. And I want to show you right now what, what that is. So right here, I have a very short script called demo.py. And it's a little three-line script. And you can see, first thing it does is it imports the storage URI um, method out of Bodo. And so that's a little. Um, convenience method for instantiating a st the storage URI class. And that class hierarchy is kind of the main thing that we've added in addition to support from multiple credentials in the Bodo config file. And what this little script will do is instantiate a URI with a given name. This happens to be a publicly readable URI. Any one of you could go run this uh, script and it will work because you'll have access to this particular Shakespeare slash rose.txt file. Um, and then it just gets the contents out as a string. Now, this is going to work fine because it's a little short file. Obviously, if it was a terabyte file, you probably wouldn't want to do this. Uh, but now I'm just going to go ahead and run it from the Python interpreter. And there it just connected to the cloud, retrieved this little short text file, and printed it out for you. So it's pretty easy to use. And there's lots of other interfaces of the URIs. You can do things like iterate over buckets and get back all the objects in the bucket. You can manipulate ACLs. There's lots more than I'm not showing you here. I just want to give you an example of how easy it is to use as a basic function just to use this library. Um, 
The other comment I want to make is that that script, as it stands, you can basically drop inside of an App Engine app and make it work. And so I want to show you that. If we look back at the slideshow now, here is a essentially complete App Engine app. And you can see highlighted in here are basically the lines I just had in that script I ran for you. Um, and it's basically complete. I've left out some imports, and I've left out some exception handling that you'd probably want to implement if you're implementing a real application. But for the purposes of this, it's basically complete. And all this does is when a user requests the web page, it connects and retrieves that object from the cloud, from Google Storage, paints it in as a pre-formatted HTML page, and renders it to the user. And now I'm going to show you. I've actually uploaded this. Um, application. If you notice, I've given it an app ID for those of you who've used um, Google App Engine. The app ID is cloudreader-demo. So I've uploaded it. This is running on actual um, Google production servers. It's that, it's that App Engine app. Oops. What just happened here? Oh, something didn't work. Oh, well. That's how you know it's real and it's not a fake demo. <laughs> OK. So that's it. Thank you. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're beginning a preview period now. And during the preview period, uh, your use of Google Storage is free. Uh, we are publishing some pricing information uh, about uh, the uh, pricing that we'll have uh, after the preview period. It's a pretty simple model. You pay for the data that you store, uh, aggregated uh, month by month, you pay for each request that you make, you pay for transfer of bandwidth. And these terms are, uh, this, this price sheet is also available on the website, so uh, it's, uh, it'll be easy for you to refer to. During the period, we're not offering any particular SLA. We are taking the availability and reliability of the service very seriously, uh, but um, it's, um, but we're not offering an SLA. We will be offering an SLA in the near future. Uh, we'll also be offering some additional support options uh, beyond the normal uh, online forums, discussion groups, and so on. We'll be making Google Storage available to premium apps customers. Today, uh, if you need to use a, a, a plain Google Apps account, not a, not a, a premium apps Google uh, account to sign up for Google Storage. Uh, and we'll be dealing with that very soon. I mentioned earlier that we're going to be allowing you to specify sharing to groups. That's not in the service today, but it will be very soon. We're also working on resumable uploads. You know, I uploaded an object just the other day that was 98 gigabytes. I wanted to leave myself a little bit of headroom in my 100 gigabyte quota. Uh, but, um, you know, if, uh, if something I, I said earlier, things fail all the time. If something, if the connection had been dropped for some reason partway through that upload, that would have been very inconvenient to have to start over. And if it's a much bigger object, even more inconvenient. So we're going to make it possible to resume uploads. And as I mentioned earlier, we're deploying our storage systems in multiple geographic locations, but all in the United States currently. We'll be uh, announcing additional regions in the not too distant future. So um, how can you get started with Google Storage? Well, you can request an invitation. Uh, I will say we published this and uh, we got a lot more interest than we expected. So our uh, invitation servers have been absolutely slammed. Uh, so my apologies if you have trouble uh, getting an invitation right away, but uh, we're working on that. Uh, we're working to, to fix that uh, very quickly. That system's not based on Google Storage. Uh, so. And um, be sure when you fill in your request for an invitation that you write that you attended the I.O. session in the additional information section. We're getting a large number of requests, and we want to make sure that you People who came to the session are, uh, are priority people for getting your invitations. And then we'll send an invitation in, in your email. Uh, and on the bit.ly link there, by the way, that's dbo, not zero, b1f. So um, with that, uh, I think we're ready to go to questions. Uh, 
I'm going to ask you, Mike, to flip your machine over to the uh, to the wavelength for questions. Oh, okay. So if you are, are going to ask a question here, please uh, come up and use one of the microphones so that we can capture it for posterity. Yeah. What about CDN usage, like Akamai or stuff like that? Uh, we're not announcing any specific, any particular CDN product. Google has a, a, a very, um, uh, it has a, a global presence with its network, and it has, uh, we take advantage of a wide range of excellent Google technologies to, uh, to deliver high performance. Go ahead. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a double question, actually. I saw you were using MD5 as the hash of the files. It's very easy, actually, to generate collision for MD5. So do you, do you actually use something else? Do you provide any other hash function for retrieving your fingerprints of the files? Uh, no, we don't, and the reason for that is partly an interoperability issue, but uh, I was concerned about that, too, and, and looked into that back when we uh, started working on the, the project. And what we're really using the MD5 hash for in this case is not any kind of security or authentication. It's really just kind of a checksum to make sure that an upload succeeded, or for you to make a request and say, uh, if I, if the, the version of the object that's in storage is different from the one that I know about, the one that I scrolled an MD5 hash away for, then um, I want to, then I want to do something. So it, it, we we don't see any vulnerabilities that come out of the fact that collisions are in fact possible in MD5. Okay, and then um, the second part of my question is: besides the RESTful APIs that you presented, do you have an API that, for example, could take a hash as input and return? the buckets and the objects that actually have that content? No, we don't. Is it something you're planning on doing? We're interested in hearing what anybody thinks would be uh, valuable to do, and uh, so we'd love to hear your suggestions. And in fact, on our website, there's a place where you can go make suggestions. And we encourage everybody who has ideas for features and functions they'd like to see in the service to uh, to let us know about them. We'll be, we'll be paying good attention to that. And, and also, just to add to that, we have a sandbox. We'd love to have people come talk to us one-on-one, -on -one, talk to, about ideas like that. It's over under Google Code out on the floor. Okay, thanks. So I think uh, we should probably take uh, one of the online questions. So uh, the first question, what advantages does Google Storage have over Amazon's S3? Well, um, I'm not really uh, in much of a position to comment on Amazon's products and services. Um, we hope that you will take a good look at the different cloud storage providers that are available to you and make a determination about what makes sense for you to use. Let's see. Oh, it's right here, isn't it? Yeah, that would be easier. Uh, will controls over location of data be provided for Google Storage? Distribution is great for speed, but there are legislative issues internationally. When I mentioned earlier that we will be announcing additional regions, yes, we will give you control over, over use of those regions. So why don't we take one here? Um, can you comment on uh, the comparison of this and the uh, Blob Store functionality? Oh, sure, yeah. The uh, App Engine's Blob Store API is optimized for use in uh, App Engine in that the references uh, are designed to be stored in the, in the App Engine data store, and when, when you pull a reference out of the App Engine data store, you can immediately use that to, App Engine can immediately use that to dereference the blob. It's kind of a different service. You know, they, they offer objects up to two gigabytes, which is ample for, for many, many applications. Uh, we offer, you know, this service offers much uh, larger, um, much larger objects uh, as a possibility. So, you know, they're, they're similar in that they're both blob storage services, but there are a lot of differences in, we, we think, in kind of the scenarios that they fit into. Um, is there support, or have you thought about support for uh, sort of like meta keys, such as 404, 403, or, uh, or the mill key, um, so that you could potentially just run static sites directly off of uh, uh, GS? Hmm, that's an interesting question. We haven't really thought about that, uh, and that uh, definitely falls into the category of uh, things we'd love to talk to you about. Go ahead. Uh, I have two parts. Uh, the first is, uh, do you have versioned objects? So c can I version an object? No, we don't currently have versioned objects. 
Okay, second, uh, I appreciate the consistency model, but um, uh, it clearly influences uh, latency. Can you a bit uh, go in, uh, explain a bit how, how this works? Uh, sure. The um, I, I won't go into great details because this kind of gets into some uh, some things that we've worked very hard on for a very long time. <laughs> but uh, the um, I, I think if you experiment with uh, Google Storage, you'll find that uh, you get uh, really good latency on read and write operations. <laughs> 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 I encourage you to go try it out and find out for yourself. <laughs> go ahead. Um, do you have to pay for um, bandwidth from App Engine to Google Storage? Uh, let's see. That's, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I'm actually going to uh, hand that over to, uh, to our product manager. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to invite Jesse to, to come on up and join us on the stage, because I don't know the answer. Do we have a, oh, yeah, we have a microphone. Okay. Um, actually, the answer is really simple because we're actually still evaluating what's the best way to do it. Uh, we will collect data during the preview period and uh, figure out what's the best way forward. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, so let's see. We had another question online here. Google Account API is very useful in App Engine app, but my app allows now allows user login using Google Account, Twitter, and Facebook. Is there any guide about how to implement it on App Engine? Um, hmm. I'm not sure I'm actually completely following this question, but I think the, the um, I think what Mike demonstrated earlier about using uh, Google Storage from App Engine uh, might be a, a good guideline for uh, for getting started. Go ahead. Um, uh, when I make a request, does it support progressive download or streaming? Can I stream from the service? Can you stream from the service? Well, we. We don't really have explicit support for you know rate rate controlled streaming. We do have range get operations, so you can get uh, partial objects. And um, and I've played with it a bit, and I've had uh, I've I have in fact you know uploaded media files and and played them out, and um, and it's worked well. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested in, in support for streaming operations, I'd like to hear more about what your needs are. All right. Could you comment on recursion um, with the GS util tool for subdirectories and stuff? Sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Recurs the recursing into recurs subdirectories. Recursive copies on subdirectories with the GS util tool. Is that possible? Yes. So um, we basically decided to make the interface simpler than normal Unix. Um, command line tools, you actually explicitly say minus R, and we felt a pretty common case if you name a directory is you just want that directory. So you, if you want to copy an entire directory, you just name the directory, or you can use wildcards within the directory, and similarly on the bucket side. Would, would that work the same, because the buckets are flat structured? Oh, so there are cases, that's a good question, there are cases where um, the object names that are inside of buckets will not be compatible with a file name. So let me give you an example. Suppose you had a bucket with, suppose you had a bucket that had uh, an object called x and another object called x slash y. If you just did a, a copy of all of the objects in the bucket into the local file system, it would first create that object x as a file, and then it would go to try to create the object x slash y, and it would fail because there is a directory, there's a file where a directory needs to go, namely x. And the tool actually catches some cases like that. It tries to do some things to prevent errors or detect things like that and, and warn you about it. But that's just the consequence of the fact that the hierarchical and flat namespaces are sort of not always compatible. Thank you. I'm going to cover a few of the uh, questions online uh, all at once. So um, uh, you, you can uh, see we have questions about do we plan to offer encryption? Uh, is there a timeline for replication? Are we thinking about creating any open storage specs? Uh, and we're, we're not really going to talk about specifics for features that I didn't already mention, and we don't have a timeline that we're prepared to announce for the things that we did talk about. Go ahead. 
So there is a storage-like service today in Google. I, I, I think I pay for it, and I have like 80 GB assigned. Is, is this going to somehow integrate with whole Google Docs and Mail and all those things? And can I actually pull files from Docs using this API and put files for Docs using this API? Uh, not at present. Um, we, they're, they're really separate services in that uh, the Docs List API is really designed for one set of use cases, and Google Storage is, is kind of designed for a different set of use cases. But we're very interested in hearing uh, about interest in uh, that kind of connection. It's, it's certainly not infeasible, but it's not something that we've uh, done yet. Are there any uh, rate limits on uploading and downloading? Uh, any, let's yeah. see. Um, no. <laughs> there aren't any rate limits on uploading and downloading that, that we've imposed. I mean, there, there are certainly limits that uh, that the infrastructure between your machine and my machine uh, will impose on us, but that's about it. Uh, just a question about authentication. So um, having beaten my head up with auth sub and OAuth, uh, are we now getting a, another third option to, to play with, <laughs> whether we like it or not? Uh, for, are, so is the question, are we going to be adding OAuth support? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, it's some, again, that's something that we're interested in hearing about uh, the level of interest that people have, so. And then as a follow-on to that, if it was a server-to-server -server based platform, so clients were uploading things into our, our product and then we wanted to put it into this back end to take advantage of replication and all the other mm -hmm. good stuff, um, would best practice be to register a specific Google account and, and basically just run it on that basis that it's uh, only for that server environment? Uh, I think that sounds like a, a very good way to do it, yeah. Yeah, I, that's, that's probably what I would do in that, in that situation. Uh, what about support or plans for support for custom metadata on buckets or objects? Oh yeah, there is support for a limited amount of custom metadata. This, again, this is kind of, a, uh, if you're familiar with uh, other RESTful APIs, it's a similar kind of thing where you can supply HTTP headers that say x dash goog dash meta dash your tag and then a value, uh, and you can store a couple of kilobytes of uh, metadata uh, with an object there. I think we're uh, about out of time, but thank you very much for your attention. Can we just quit? Just quit on the whole thing.